Welcome back everyone, it's me again, Matt. Hope you're having a great day talking about more tanks again. Yes, we have been going pretty hard with the armored fighting vehicles in my channel recently. I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. A lot of good feedback from you, so please keep it coming if you are enjoying this content. We are talking about Japanese armored fighting vehicles today and a beast at that. The Type 90 main battle tank, which has been superseded by the Type 10 main battle tank which you can also go check out on my channel if you have interest in the link attached right now above uh, but today we are talking about the type 90 a little bit older the leopard 2 look like as i always call it uh, kind of a strange looking vehicle considering it's almost like a hybrid of a leopard 2 cross abrams cross i don't even know but it's kind of cool looking i think it's got that sort of domineering look to it uh, you wouldn't want to mess with this tank even to this day even though it's quite old the development of the tank actually started in 1976 though, as part of the STC program to truly build a modern tank for the Japanese self-defense forces. Although shortly afterwards, the development program received a different designation known as the TKX. Now it's definitely not to say that the mass-produced Japanese service tank of that time, the Type 74 main battle tank, wasn't a solid choice considering the time it was designed, which was the early 1960s. But the appearance of modern Soviet tanks such as the T-64, T-64 Alpha and the T-72 made it quickly obsolete and by the end of the 1970s when it appeared in any meaningful numbers it was totally outdated. With its steel armour and 105mm gun it was roughly on par with the M60 series or the Leopard 1. But its steel armour and the 105mm gun just wouldn't cut it against the rapidly evolving designs of the Soviet Union. The Japanese themselves realized that something was better needed, and something was that of the Type 90. All post-war Japanese tanks were designed with defense in mind, and this tank would be of no exception. Since its 1976 approval, the development process took a few years to pick up some steam. One of the important principles for the Japanese was self-reliance, as many components as possible were to not only be produced in Japan, but also designed there. This, of course, would cost not only time, but also a lot of money. And between 1978 and 1980, the Japanese were slowly approving the funding for various tank components, including the gun and the engine. The general military requirements for the tank itself were issued in 1980. Apart from the previously mentioned self-reliance, the tank was to be protected by advanced composite armor and armed with indigenous 120mm smoothbore gun by Japan Steelworks Limited that would fire special Japanese ammunition. This unfortunately wasn't a great decision for the vehicle. The development of such a weapon system is notoriously expensive and very, very slow. Nevertheless, the Japanese built two prototypes with this gun between 1982 and 1984 and were thoroughly tested until 1986. You can see how much time it takes just to design a gun. Four years, folks, to get a gun that works properly for a tank that they want to design all themselves. It's impressive, but nonetheless takes so much time. Around that time, the costs of the program were ramping up, along with the development delays. The Japanese re-evaluated their decision about the gun and decided instead to license produce the famous Rheinmetall L44 120mm smoothbore gun. After all that effort, unfortunately, they just went with the old school 120mm L44. This was of course a cheaper solution and even the self-reliance principle was kind of upheld. The gun would be produced in Japan after all. This German-Japanese collaboration would turn out to be much more successful than the one of four decades prior. The second batch of four prototypes built between 1986 and 1988 was already armed with the German cannon and was again thoroughly and successfully tested until 1989. The tank was formally accepted in service in 1991 to the Japanese Self-Defense Force under the designation of the Type 90. For its time, the vehicle was quite perfectly adequate and on par with its American Abrams and German Leopard 2 cousin counterparts. It weighed 50 tons. The weight was limited in order for it to, amongst other things, be able to use standard bridges in Japan. Being that it's an island nation, it's limited on its transportation around that island, whether it be roads, mountains, etc. So it needed to be able to cross rivers and bridges very easily. But unlike the western designs, with the exception of the Leclerc, it had a crew of three, with the loader being replaced by an automatic loading mechanism. Yes, they went for an automatic loader also. The armor composition of this vehicle is currently classified still to this day, although it's likely to consist of steel with some sort of ceramic inlays. Even though the vehicle turret resembles the Leopard 2 MBT, the armor layout is likely very different and designed completely in Japan. 
Either way, the tank's protection levels are pretty much on par to other modern battle tanks of the time in the early 1990s. The tank's protection was further enhanced by laser warning designation system, an NBC filtering system or nuclear, biological and chemical warfare protection system, smoke grenade launchers and all the usual ancillaries that you would get on most main battle tanks of the time. Another important aspect of this MBT is its mobility, and the Type 90 was definitely not lacking in that regard. It was powered by a 1500 horsepower Mitsubishi 10ZG two-stroke water-cooled diesel stroke engine paired with an automatic transmission, four forward gears and two reverse gears. That allowed it to go as fast as 70 km an hour forward and 42 km an hour in reverse. This thing was zippy folks, very zippy, one of the fastest tanks out there. Maximum speed, however, is not everything, and when you're pushing 50 tons, you better make sure that you have some good suspension to go with it. In the end, agility and the abilities of the suspension play rule on the battlefield when it comes to main battle tanks, and this was something that the Type 90 truly exceeded in thanks to its hydropneumatic suspension that allowed the driver to tilt the vehicle forward and backward, unfortunately not to the sides. This allowed the vehicle to adjust the terrain it was going across or potentially put itself in a full hull down position, limiting its exposure in terms of its height to the enemy that it was engaging. To understand the importance of this feature for the Japanese, one really has to realise that Japan is a mountainous country. Making good gun elevation and depression is critically important as a trait for a tank in this kind of terrain. A tank has to be able to fire both above and below its position with ease, and a hydropneumatic suspension with tilting abilities allows the operator to do just that. In this case, the system allowed the tank to change its frontal and rear clearance from 20cm to 60cm. However, on the other hand, such a system was very expensive not only to install and design, but also to maintain and it was fairly prone to failure. This is because when you put 50 tons against something that is adjustable and fairly finicky, it's going to have a lot of problems and adds to the mechanical failure rate of the tank itself. Driving the already high production costs even higher to make this tank was definitely added with this kind of system. This would play a major role in what happened to the vehicle after its introduction. But of course, the key thing to this tank is its firepower. As I stated before, the tank was armed with the automatically loaded licensed produced version of the Rheinmetall L44 smoothbore. The gun accuracy was ensured by a thermal sleeve and muzzle reference system. The gun itself was fed by a bustle mounted Mitsubishi automatic loading mechanism and was fully stabilized. 16 rounds of NATO standard 120mm ammunition were ready in the loader and with the ammunition stored in the tank. The rate of fire was between 10 to 15 rounds per minute which was fairly substantial for that time. The tank's fire control system consisted of the Nikon Optics and Fujitsu Thermal Imager and Digital Firing Computer and Laser Rangefinder. It was capable of automatic target tracking, a highly advanced feature at the time. The FCS even continued to track the target if it disappeared out of sight based on speed and direction and predicted where it was going to come out the other end. Additionally, just like most tanks of that time, the vehicle had a hunter-killer capability with the commander designating a target while the gunner was engaging a different one. This is the optic that you see rotating on top of the turret that is independent to the gunner and normally referred to as the commander's independent thermal viewer on things like the Abrams and other main battle tanks. Such complex and advanced features do come, however, with a very hefty price tag. Nevertheless, the Japanese were prepared to invest in their military to give them the very best equipment obtainable in order to protect the homeland from the potential Soviet menace at the time. And then the Soviet Union collapsed. And of course, if many of you are used to my channel, you're going to know exactly what I'm going to say next. Several rounds of budget cuts connected to the disappearance of an immediate threat slowed the production of this tank to a crawl and the Japanese were only gradually replacing the obsolete Type 74 and Type 61 tanks for almost two decades. The Type 90 was produced in several batches between 1990 and 2009. The 341 built tanks were nowhere near enough to replace the older machines in the SDF service. The ancient Type 61 tank was finally phased out in 2000 but the Type 74 continues to soldier alongside the Type 90 and the Type 10, with several hundred still in the Japanese inventory. As for the Type 90 itself, the Type 10 MBT, commonly mentioned as its successor, is in fact not designed to replace it, but to complement it along with the remaining Type 74 tanks, and once again, the Type 10 is a costly vehicle with a very, very slow production rate. 
As a result, the Type 90 is expected to serve for many more years to come, with the tank only being used by the Japanese and not offered for export. Partially due to a set of very strict weapons export laws, its service life is relatively low uneventful. It is not expected to ever fire a shot in anger. Meanwhile though, the tanks that are putting shots in anger are really kind of being put up to the challenge of could they put anything against the Type 10 and Type 90? It's a question I always ask myself. These tanks have never really been placed into a combat scenario. They've never really been placed in other sort of areas, whether it be the desert or snowy conditions. They've really just been placed upon, you know, the Japanese defense and that's perfectly suited for what they need in their environment. I'd be interested to see, you know, how they compare up to some of the more sort of worldwide level base tanks that are out there, the Abrams, etc. Uh, but maybe that's something we'll look at for a future video if you uh, want to take a look at it. So folks, I really do appreciate you uh, coming by today on today's video. It means a lot to me. I know there's a lot of craziness going on right now. I hope you're all taking care of yourself. I'm going to try my best to produce as much content as I can for you guys as we go through these challenging times. If one more person says we're going through unprecedented times, I'm going to scream. Uh, but it is what it is. I just want to make sure that you're all looking after one another and staying healthy and safe. Um, if you did enjoy today's video, please leave me a like. I'd love to hear your feedback in the comments section. You guys have been doing a great job of doing so, so thank you so much. Much. If you do want to support my channel, you're more than welcome to uh, uh, go to my Patreon page, which is my uh, crowdfunding kind of support page for donations. And thank you to everyone who has been donating to there. I really cannot thank you enough. It really does mean a lot to me uh, and this channel and us as a community because it allows me to produce more content and better content for you guys uh, with getting new things and items for the producing videos um also if you want to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future i would strongly encourage you to hit that little bell button by the subscribe button the reason for this is youtube is totally totally burning me to the ground right now uh with viewership i'm not sure what's going on i don't understand how um, i'm producing content and barely getting any views and the robot videos are getting bazillions of views um and they're just basically uh robots that are just talking about vehicles that they've found news articles about and it just kind of kills me inside um, i put a lot of time and effort into this channel and it just kind of hurts to know that the platform just doesn't support me but anyway i'll stop crying a river there's a lot more important things going on right now but uh, i appreciate you all so so much for coming by on these videos and if you could share them around i really would appreciate that also take care everyone please stay safe we will get through these challenging times i promise you we just gotta fight through it one day at a time all the best Bye-bye.